little RSVP thing that are here yet, but they'll be here long. I saw a couple of them dropping their kids off in children's ministry. We're going to go ahead and get our service time started. Um, I, we're glad you're here today, and if you are new to Aviano Baptist or new, if your COVID's kept you away or whatever for a while and you're new-ish, back here for the first time in a long time, I want to say on behalf of our Aviano Baptist Church community, welcome. We're glad you're here. My name is Barry Cole. I'm the pastor here. And what we strive to do and strive to be as a church community is a place where you can come regardless of your background or maybe it's a different denomination or maybe you've been out of church for a while or frankly you just got more questions than answers about Jesus. And this is a place where you can come, we'll connect you to the church family so we can grow together to know and love Jesus more and that we can then be equipped better to go out there and take his message of hope into the community. So we're glad you're here this morning, especially if this is your first time with us. If this is your first time, that's a little bit about our church. And so I want to just invite you and ask you to do us a favor and tell us a little bit about you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything crazy or embarrassing, just fill this little slip out. Um, and then there's some offering plates in the back of the sanctuary here. So after the service, on your way out, just drop them in there uh, as, as, when the service is over. Now, on the back of those, and this is for everybody, it says prayer requests. And so if there is a way that we can be praying for you, a way that specifically we can minister to you, would you jot that down? If you didn't grab one when you came in, as you come into the Welcome Center, there's some of these right next to the offering plate. By the way, if you want to give, you know, write your check as a, your tithes and offerings as a check, you can drop it in the offering plate out there. There's also instructions on the website about how to give online. Uh, but if you grab these, they're right there by the offering plate when you come in. If you didn't do that, but you have a prayer request or something you would like us to know in some way we can minister to you, there's some sitting over there on the baptistry, so don't hesitate to grab them. You too, just drop them in the offering plate after the service um, so that we can know and we can contact you about those prayer requests. Well, let me mention a couple of things, some announcements that are going on. Um, and so I, I, I got to change the way we're doing announcements. Jeannie was working sound last Sunday, and she said to me after the service, she said, you know, your announcement section was eight minutes long. Just saying, eight minutes long. So I'm, I'm, I'm changing the way we're doing announcements. You'll see some different things we'll be trying in the coming weeks to change the way we're doing announcements. Because starting next Sunday, we're going to try to add a few more songs back into the service. But that means we've got to cut time somewhere. So that means they've got to cut it out of announcements. So you'll see some ways to do that. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm just going to hit the headlines. And so I encourage you to check out the, the service. You'll find it as an event in you, the YouVersion Bible app. You'll also find the announcements in, in your email. If you're part of our email group, you'll also find them on the Facebook page, and we share the link in the WhatsApp group. So they're out there in a lot of different electronic formats. So check them out, and we give you the headlines, and then encourage you to go um, read the, the details about them. So home group Bible studies have all started. So if you ain't in a home group, I encourage you to get in a home group. All the details are there in the announcements, so check that out. We are looking for a men's ministry director, so there's a lot, of, a lot of guys in here, but guys, pray about that. If you feel the Lord is, is leading you in that direction, then you come and talk to me about the men's ministry. So for right now, our men's ministry activity is kind of taking a knee until, until we have that nailed down. Um, Awana is on is Sundays at 5 o'clock, so just like with home groups, if your kids ain't in Awana, get them in Awana. 5 o'clock Sundays, all the information's there. Um, POC and all that in the announcements. If your children are in children's ministry on a regular basis, we need you to register them. So we have information like allergies and, and emergency contact information, stuff like that. The link to do that is on our website, so note that information there in the announcements about that. Women's Bible study this Tuesday um, at 6.30. So again, information in the announcements about that. Also information in there about how you can give and how you can give online. So there's all the headlines. So check out the details later on. One announcement I do want to make, and this, I'll put this on Facebook this afternoon. It's not currently in these announcements, but I'll put it on Facebook. And we're going to talk about it so much in the coming weeks that I, by the time it happens, I want you to be sick of hearing it because I, I want to make sure everybody knows the way forward. Now, if you are new to our church or haven't been here in a while, we're moving. We're changing locations. So the, in December, the 1st of December, we're going to move to this Capolino Furniture Store right across the street here. So starting in December, that's where we'll be. So here's the way forward. Our last live service in this building will be the 15th of November. 
And then the last two Sundays of November will be virtual services, and thanks to COVID, we know how to do that very well. So we've, we've got to give ourselves some time to get everything out of here and packed up and get this place cleaned up so that we can turn over the keys at the end of November. So our last live service, the 15th of November, our first live service in the new building will be the first Sunday in December, the 6th of December. But here's the other big news about that. That sanctuary is big enough that we can go back to one service. I think I just heard a little praise Jesus from the praise team. So starting in December, the 6th of December, we're going to go back to one service. It will be at 10 o'clock. I know, you guys, it's the 1045 crowd. That's 45 minutes less sleep on Sunday morning, but we tried to find a time that just splits the difference. So t starting the 6th of December, not, not next Sunday, write this on your calendar, 6th December, starting then, one service at 10 o'clock, because I, what I don't want you to do is show up at 9.15 on the, on the 6th of December, and then you got 45 minutes to wait. Better that than you show up at 10.45 and you miss the whole service. So just know, starting then on the 6th of December, and I'm going to put this on Facebook this afternoon, and more details will be coming out, and we'll be talking about it as we get closer to that. So that's our way forward. A lot of exciting days ahead for Aviano Baptist, and we're just so thrilled that God has given us the opportunity to be a part of it, and we're excited about what he's doing. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we're excited about it as well, and so we're going to rejoice and be glad in it, and I invite you now to stand and pull up your masks. When we're seated, they can be down. When we're standing, we've got to pull our masks up, so pull your mask up as we sing some praises to our Lord. Well, good morning. Welcome. Uh, please stand, and let's open in prayer. God, you're good. And we just thank you that we are able to gather here today as your church to, to praise and worship you. Lord, we just pray that you will bless this time that we have together as we lift up songs of praise and prayers and as we open your word. Pray that you will just speak to us and open our hearts to hear your word so that we may go forth uh, better able to walk as you would have us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Be seated. Well, thank you as always, praise team, week after week. I told this story in the first service, so just so you guys don't feel like you're left out and didn't get something they get, I'll tell you the story here too. And this is kind of the good thing about being in a military church like this, is I only have to have like four or five stories. And I can just tell them over and over again, because there's always new people coming into this community, and they're all like, always like they're brand new. But that song, every time I, I hear that song or sing that song, I have to smile a little bit. Several years ago, it's maybe 2011 or something, Jeannie and I were invited to visit some friends of ours. who They live in Starkville, Mississippi. But they're an elderly couple. He is pastoring, he at the time was pastoring First Baptist Church of Scuba, Mississippi. Now, Scuba, Mississippi, best I can tell, is a town of about 100 people. And when we drove in, it looked like a ghost town. I mean, literally, the buildings were all, like, boarded up. And there's about 100 people in town. But it's in Mississippi, right? So there's, like, three churches in town, even those 100 people. And he, he pastors First Baptist Scuba. So the weekend we were there happened to be like this weekend. They have this big picnic every year. The whole town comes out to this picnic. And so we're there with our friends, and, and this couple comes over and sits with us. This couple's name is J.R. and Eunice. And I've met this couple once, but I will never forget this couple. They sat down. Now, J.R. and Eunice had been in Scuba Baptist Church since the very founding of it. So they've probably been in the church for, they're in their 80s. They've probably been in the church for 60 years. So if anything's going to happen in Scuba Baptist Church, J.R. and Eunice have to give their stamp of approval. In fact, you want to get something done, you just go get one of them to nod their head up and down, and it will happen. So we're sitting there, and we're enjoying this Mississippi barbecue, and it's fantastic. And Sandy, our friend, says, oh, you know what? Barry and Jeannie are fantastic singers. And so what she didn't tell them, because I think maybe Sandy's memory is starting to slip just a little bit, because what she didn't tell them was Jeannie's a fantastic singer, and I can carry a tune in a bucket. That's what she didn't say, but that what she said was, oh, they're fantastic singers. So this is 9 o'clock at night on Saturday, y'all. And Eunice says to us, y'all are singing special music tomorrow in the service. It was not a question. It was a statement. There was one acceptable answer to Eunice, and that was yes, ma'am. So 7 o'clock Sunday morning, we're in the parsonage on this tinny out of tune piano trying to get this song put together. Now, we get in the church... And my wife and I are no spring chickens, but we were the youth group in that church. I just got it. That sort of describes the church that we were in. We were the youth group when we walked in. And so fortunately, I think maybe as we were singing, I saw a lot of hearing aids being turned down. I think that's because I was singing along with them. But every time I, every time I hear that song, I, just, I have to smile. I remember this whole event there and J.R. and Eunice and, and uh, bringing us up to do that. Well, we're glad you're here this morning. Take out your Bible if you got one with you. I hope you do or the, the Bible app on your device. And by the way, we make, if you're new here, we make a lot of use of the YouVersion Bible app. It's a free app you can find in any of the app store. Just type in YouVersion and it'll, it'll pop up. We make a lot of use of it. We have our service as an event in there. And every week you'll find not only our service there, you'll find the announcements. You'll also find the scripture laid out for the, for the service that Sunday. And then a downloadable link to our note-taking guide. And every week I try to do a little fill-in-the-blank note-taking guide. I post it on our website, but then we put a link to it there in the YouVersion event. So you can find it there, but open up your, the app on your device if you've got a Bible app with you. Turn back with me to 1 Thessalonians. Last several weeks, we are now going methodically through this book of 1 Thessalonians. And we're going to finish out chapter 2 this morning. 
took the first half of chapter 2 last week, and we talked about how, how Paul is encouraging the church there and encouraging us then to live in a way that is worthy of the calling that God has in our lives. And I'm, kinda, I'm calling this sort of general theme of this sermon series through 1 Thessalonians, I'm calling it counterculture. Because that's, that's in a sense really what Paul was encouraging that church to do, to live in a world that rejects Christ. And that's, that's where we are today. That's the world we live in, the society we live in, that's the society they lived in. It wasn't easy being a Christian in Thessalonica. And they routinely faced persecution. They routinely faced suffering in the church in those days. And I think today, often as we hear that stuff talked about, and, and it's tempting to think, that's old time stuff. Persecution, suffering for religion, that's old time stuff. That doesn't happen today. This is the 21st century. We're much more enlightened. We're much more technologically advanced. That kind of stuff doesn't happen today. I think it was last year, the BBC uh, published a study, and they said this. They said, one in three people around the world suffer from religious persecution. That was in 2019, they published that. One in three people. I think there are seven billion people, I think, in this world today. And one-third of them, according to that study, is suffering from some form of religious persecution. And what they found in that study is that the vast majority of those were suffering for their Christian faith. So it's easy for us to read things in Scripture, read this letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians about the suffering and the persecution, and say there's no application to our lives today. That's old-time stuff. And then many of us are not going to experience the kind of persecution they did, the kind of suffering they did, the kind of suffering that so many are around the world, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Persecution and suffering of, for our beliefs happens today. It just looks very different. Even us, a Western, a mostly American congregation, a Western European congregation, it still happens. It just looks very different. It looks like this. Maybe jokes made by coworkers because of your faith. Oh, here comes the chaplain, right? Not said in an encouraging way, not said in, a, in, a, in an edifying way. Here comes the chaplain, here comes the Bible thumper, right? Every time you, you come around and talk about your faith, jokes made by your coworkers. That's modern day persecution. Being called names for our beliefs. And that happens a lot in our society where we are labeled a certain thing because we're believers, because we're Christians, and we hold to the Bible those labels that are dropped on us before we even, people even know who we are. Being silenced by the cries of tolerance or political correctness. Those, those are forms of, of every right now religious persecution, opposition, suffering in the sense that you and I face. So it's not the same. We can't put it in the same category of these folks that were suffering in a real physical way. But it's, it's just as real, and it's just as challenging in our lives. But here's the thing, and this is something, it, it, can tempt, it can cause us to be tempted to stand down, right? Nobody wants to be made fun of in their workplace. Nobody wants their friends to, to shun them or not invite them to events anymore. Nobody wants that to happen. And so it's easy to, to kind of stand down, right? And get on the sidelines and say, well, listen, I don't really like the way that feels, so I'm just going to be quiet. I'm not going to talk about my faith at all. But I want to encourage you with this, that persecution, suffering, any, of, any kind of persecution or suffering, listen, that is evidence of God at work. It means that people notice a difference in you. They notice something has changed in your life. That's what they're reacting to. And it very, so much so that the apostles considered it a privilege to suffer for the name of Christ. Now, I've got to ask you, and I just got to confess that I don't always consider it a privilege to suffer for the name of Christ. I often don't look at it that way. But it's evidence of God at work in our lives. And as Paul writes this letter to the Thessalonians, as they're, as they're dealing with and experiencing persecution and suffering and, and outright opposition to the work of God, he writes this letter, and here's our big, big idea today. I'm not responding up here, Amy. I'm not sure. I think I noticed last week the batteries are going dead in this, and I've done nothing about it, so they're still dead today. Um, but here's the big idea. And if you're new with us, I like to kind of pull this out. This is sort of the main thought of this section, this paragraph, verses 13 through 20 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Here's sort of the main central thought. 
That as Paul is writing to this church to encourage them of how to live for Christ in a world that rejects Christ, and and specifically in the context of suffering and persecution, here's kind of his thought to them, that God has given us the resources that we need to live out his countercultural mission. Our temptation in the face of any kind of opposition for our faith is to kind of just float along with the current of society. Right, float along with the current of what the what those around us, our coworkers, our friends, or our acquaintances might say and do, because we don't want to be called out. We don't want to experience that kind of opposition. So we don't live counterculturally. We live along with the current. And and Paul just reminds me, reminds us that listen, when those times come, God has given you the resources that you need. And I want us to take a look at what those resources are. But you follow along, First Thessalonians chapter two. I'm going to be reading verses 13 through 20. And he says, For this reason we also constantly thank God, that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of man, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, For you also endured the same sufferings at the hand of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They're not pleasing to God, but they're hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren... Having been taken away from you for a short while in person, but not in spirit, we're all the more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan has hindered us. For who is our hope, or joy, or crown, or exultation? Is it not even you, in the presence of our Lord Jesus that is coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you that you are so good to us. And in your grace and in your mercy and in your love, you have given us this letter. And Lord, we are keenly aware that if the church in Thessalonica had not been suffering, had not been struggling with this issue of how to live counterculturally, we're keenly aware we would not have this letter. So, Father, thank you for even allowing that to happen in their lives. That you could instruct us some 2,000 years later. And, Lord, as you speak to us, as you remind us of the resources you have given to us, Lord, would you open our eyes, open our hearts, help us to hear and understand exactly what you have for us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, kids, this slide is for you, and I just started doing this a couple weeks ago, so I want to just call these out. There's some key words in the sermon. And so what what I do with these, and this came out of the book Parenting in the Pew, so if you want to get that book and flip through, it's got a lot of great tips and ideas. If you've got children, bringing them to the service of how to keep them engaged in the service. And so here's some of the key words, and so here's here's your task, kids. This is your slide, so here's your task. Write these words down. And then every time you hear me say one of them, just make a little mark on that page. Or if you don't have that, just remember what these words are and then just squeeze your mom or dad's hand every time you hear me say one of these words. So here's the key words for the kids. Word of God. I know that's three words and not one word, but that the phrase I will use over and over again in this message. The gospel. We're going to talk a great deal about the gospel and what that is and how that how the the culture reacted to it in Thessalonica, how they react today. And then opposition. That's a key key idea, key word in this message that Paul has for us. So those are the key words, kids. You jot those down. And I see almost got almost. All right, excellent. All right. So what are some of the resources that God has given us to live this countercultural mission that he has for us? First resource is his word. Now, he starts verse 13 with a word of thanksgiving. I mean, look there at what he says, first part of verse 13. We constantly thank God. And so he starts it with this, this just reminder, this word of thanksgiving. Now, thanksgiving is a huge theme in Thessalonians. It's it's a dominant theme of the first three chapters, but listen, y'all, the book's only five chapters long. 
So the majority of the book, the theme, the dominant theme is thanksgiving. And back in chapter 1, he expresses thanks to God for their steadfastness, their labor of love. And we looked at that a few weeks ago. How they were standing fast, holding firm to their beliefs. And he gives thanks to God for that back there in chapter 1. And here in chapter 3, he gives thanks for the joy they've brought him. And then here, he specifically gives thanks for how they handle this. How they handle the word of God. And, and the words that he uses there. He says, when you received the word of God, when you heard it from us, you accepted it. And those words, they, they mean they heard it with their ears and then they heard it with their heart. They really understood it. They, they grabbed a hold of it, made it a part of who they were. They, they really embraced the word of God. And he makes this distinction that they not only heard it, they not only accepted it and received it, but they accepted it as not the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. And that's a significant resource for us. When we talk about the Bible, very often we use that phrase, we call it the Word of God. And Paul calls it out, he says, listen, when, when you received this, you recognize that this is not like any other book on the shelf. This is not like any self-help book. This is not a, just a historical document of things that happened. A record of the church 2,000 plus years ago. It's not just that. That this is the very Word of God of God. This, this is something significant for us. See, the Word of God is unique. It's different, and it's unique and different because of this. It's divine. Its origin is divine. Its author is divine. In that sense, its content to us is divinely spoken word to us. This is unique. This is different. This is not like anything else. That's what he said to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he said this, All Scripture, all of this, is inspired by God. And you can maybe hear that term once in a while, that we believe that this is the inspired Word of God. This is where we get it from. And because of that, it's profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training and righteousness for us to, to apply it in our lives. Now, if you've got an NIV Bible, New, New International Version, that, that verse reads like this, all Scripture is God-breathed. That's the literal interpretation of that word inspired, literally the breath of God. This came from his heart, from his soul, from the very breath of God. That's what we have. And what we have here, when we open up the Bible... We don't just have one viewpoint on life among many, right? Nowadays, there's a bunch of viewpoints on life. And everybody will say, the culture will say, well, you know, it doesn't really matter because they're all the same. They're just, just pick the viewpoint that you like the best. And listen, when we look at Scripture, we don't just have one viewpoint on life. We don't just have one idea among the endless philosophies that are out there. What we have is the, are the very words of God spoken to us. We sometimes call this God's revelation to us. God is revealing Himself. This is not just a collection of stories, although it is. We have a lot of stories in there. We have the, the laws that God gave us in there. We have the, these gospel accounts in there. But this is not just a storybook. This is God showing us his heart. How did he interact in those moments? How did he interact with his people? How was he faithful to his people so long ago and continued to be through so many thousands of years? This is God's revelation of who he is. And when we read this, we realize we have something special. We have something unique and divine, and it's not just unique and different. Because of the author. Because of the nature and the character of God's Word, the Word of God is powerful. Now, I put a whole truckload of verses up there, and you can thank me later that I'm not going to go through each one of them and have a little five-minute sermonette on all of them, but I want to hit them all. And this is, just, this is just dipping our toe in the water about what the Word of God says about the Word of God and how it is powerful in our lives and powerful in this world. God, it will accomplish God's purposes. That's what Isaiah said, Isaiah 55. 
It is a lamp unto our feet and a light for our path in Psalm 119. Listen, you want to know the way? Oftentimes, sometimes God only gives us one, the next step. You know, we find the next step. God, how do you want me to react in this situation? What's my next move? It's the lamp unto our feet. And every once in a while, he'll turn on the light and he'll show us where this whole train is going, where this whole path is going. It's life-giving, Genesis chapter 1. You know, the very first thing that God did, the very first recorded thing that God did was spoke. And when he spoke, everything came into existence. It's, his word is life-giving. It's divine food for the souls. That's what Jesus is talking about, Matthew chapter 4. It judges the deepest thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Listen, raise your hand if you've ever done something stupid. I mean, just plain, flat-out stupid, right? And then afterwards, maybe somebody asks you, or you ask yourself, why did I do that? You know, I knew that was stupid. I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. I knew how that was going to turn out. Why did I do that? And then how often is your answer this? I don't know. I don't know why I did that. That was dumb, and I knew it to start, but I did it anyway. Listen, the Word of God gets down in those places that we don't know. It, it searches the thoughts and the intentions, the deepest places in the heart of man, and it exposes that stuff. And that's what he said in Hebrews chapter 4. And it's the only place that we will find the one thing that every single person on this planet needs, and that is Jesus. This is the only place that we will find him. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. John 1.1 1, 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus has been with him from the beginning. This is the only place we'll find him. One author said it this way, The way a Christian treats his Bible shows how he regards Jesus. Now, I'm just going to let that hang in the air for just a second. The way a Christian treats his Bible shows how he regards Jesus. And I can guarantee you this, that if this book does not have a prominent place in your life, if it doesn't have a, a daily place in your life, or at least several times a week, I can almost guarantee you that Jesus has no place in your day. That Jesus, you, you don't give it a second thought. You probably are not thinking about what would Christ do? What would Jesus do in this situation? What would he want me to do? If this word, if his word has no place in your life, then he probably doesn't either. That's why we spend so much time talking about being in the word. I know I harp on it a lot, but this is why. This is the most powerful tool that God has given us. You know, it is the only offensive piece of the armor of God in Ephesians 6. This the only thing we can take offense with against the wiles of the enemy. Because listen, the heart of man is deceitful. The heart of man is wicked. And if we just rely on what I feel, or what I think I ought to do, or what, what, what feels best to me in the moment, we're relying on, on a set of ideas and thoughts that come from a wicked, deceitful place. That's why we so desperately need this resource. That's why Paul starts here. Listen, you want to live counterculturally. The heart of man is going to naturally go along with the flow of the culture. And if we want to live counterculturally, the one key resource we have is the Word of God. Now listen, if you don't have a time, if, if making time in the Word of God is not part of your current routine, and you want to start doing that, I realize you might say, you know what, Pastor, I get you. I ought to be reading the Bible more. But this is not just a book. This is a library. There are 66 books in here. This is a whole big library. And I want to make the Word of God a regular part of my life, but I don't know where to begin in this. And if that's you here this morning, come talk to me after the service. Because I'd love to give you some tips and some ideas of how to start, where to start, what to do to get this to be a regular part of your life so that we can tap in to that resource that God has given us. First resource He's given us to live counterculturally, His Word. Second resource is this, His activity. That God is at work. He's not checked out. He's not silent. He's not disjointed from what is happening around us. Look, look at verse 14 again. He said, For you, brethren became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, 
who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They're not pleasing to God. They're hostile to all men. Now, a few weeks ago, we looked at chapter 1. And back there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, he was talking about examples. Remember, we, we looked at the examples. And he was holding himself up as an example. And he wasn't patting himself on the back. He wasn't you know, saying what a great guy Paul is. But he was just acknowledging that, listen, we are following after the Lord. And if you want to follow after the Lord, you would do well to follow our example. And so he, he praises them for that, for imitating him. But what does he praise them here for imitating? It's a lot less... A lot less um, attractive, right? A lot less encouraging. He praises them because they are imitating the suffering of the churches in Judea. Now, those were primarily Jewish Christians in the churches in Judea. The church in Thessalonica, we read back in Acts chapter 17 when this church was founded. It says the, the, a lot of people there in Thessalonica were God fearing Greeks that came to know Jesus. This is a gen, largely a Gentile church here in Thessalonica. And the modern city of Thessalonica is pretty much in the same place now as it was then. It's their northern part of Greece. This was a Gentile community. And almost immediately in both places, in, in the churches in Judea among Jewish Christians, in the churches here in Thessalonica, Gentile Christians, almost immediately in both places, opposition breaks out. And I mentioned this earlier already. See, the evidence of God's activity in this world is the world's opposition. When we see that the world starts to work against the church, starts to push back against the teachings of the church, starts to push back against what God wants to do in and through us, that's evidence of His activity. Now, it's easy to kind of wring our hands in those moments and, and be overwhelmed and get a little pity party, right? That, that the world opposes what the church is doing. And maybe we ought to just be quiet. Maybe we ought to just stand on the sidelines. But that's evidence of God at work. The opposition to the gospel. Here was my takeaway from this. This almost leapt off the page as I read this, this encouragement he gives them to say you are suffering there among Gentile Christians the same as they suffered among Jewish Christians. This almost leapt off the page that the opposition to the gospel transcends cultures because the gospel message transcends cultures, because the gospel's author transcends cultures cultures. And we should absolutely expect that when we have switched teams, and we now we've moved from Satan's team, and now we are on God's team, that moment we trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, we ought to expect opposition. Now, we're not looking forward to it. We're not happy about it, but we ought to expect it as evidence of God's activity. Someone once said this, that the gospel is not the kind of message that man would invent even if he could. And that points to the fact that this has a divine author. The, the author of this transcends cultures. Man wouldn't have come up with this message. God, God, God sends his own son to die for people who have no time for him. Listen, man would not have come up with that message. That is utter nonsense to the heart of man. The gospel is a pretty simple message. We're all sinners. We came into the world that way. That's our default position. We come into this world as sinners. That sin that is in our hearts separates us from God. And if we, we die with that sin unforgiven, we'll spend eternity separated from God. But God sent His Son Jesus to die on a cross and pay the penalty for your sin debt and for mine so that we might have the opportunity to be forgiven and be reconciled. Simple message. The gospel is not a complicated message. And we will experience roadblocks. We will experience setbacks, be they big ones or small ones, but we will experience them. But we're reminded of this, first part of verse 16. He said, They were hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sin. Listen, this opposition's going to come. We ought to expect it in this world. But we're reminded of something there. God notices. God is, is taking account of what is happening. He's not ignorant. He's not unaware of the opposition. He's very much aware of what is happening. He's, he says they, the, the wrath of them, they fill up the measure of their sins. God knows what is happening. And He's not only aware, but God defends His work and He defends His workers. 
God is not just standing on the sidelines idly knowing, well, yeah, it looks like they're really suffering down there. And that's, that's terrible, and I really feel for them. God is not just distant and disengaged. He defends his work, and he defends his workers. Listen, that's a huge encouragement for us. When we're in the workplace and we're experiencing some of that modern-day 21st century kind of persecution, Western European persecution, to be reminded that God is at work, that God's activity is happening, that He will ultimately defend His work and His workers. Look at the last part of verse 16. He said, But wrath has come upon them to the utmost. God will defend in His time, in His way. We don't always know what that looks like. But this is what Jesus said, John chapter 17. This is Jesus praying to the Father in John chapter 17. We often call this the high priestly prayer. He's filling that role as high priest and interceding for the people, right? That's what the high priest did in the Old Testament. He's filling that role. He's praying for, he's praying for believers, and this is what he said. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world. And that's not what Jesus is praying for us. He ever lives to make intercession for us, and what he is praying is not that God take them out of the world so they don't have to go through hard stuff. What is he praying for? What was he praying for? He still is. Protect them from the evil one. And what a huge encouragement to know that when that persecution, when that suffering, when those difficulties come because of our faith, that God will defend not only his work, but he'll defend his workers, that Jesus is praying that specific thing. God's Word, that's a huge resource for us. God's activity to remember that, that He is working in this world. He will defend His work and His workers. The last thing, His victory. God's victory. There's an old Southern Gospel song, and it said, I read the back of the book, and God wins. You ever done that? You read a book, and you want to know how the story's going to turn out? And you, just, you get impatient, you know, I just can't, is this character going to live? Are they going to get out of this? And so you flip to the back of the book, right, to see, oh, they make it to the end of the book, good. You know, I know, I know they got out of this mess. Well, I've read the back of the book. Spoiler alert, God wins. And what an incredible encouragement to say, he already has secured the victory. We don't have to wonder, is God going to win this battle? Is so, Satan ultimately going to be victorious? We don't have to worry about that. He has already won. Now, Paul describes the intensity of the opposition they face. He doesn't sugarcoat any of it. Verse 17. And he said, But we, brethren, have been taken away from you for a short while. And that word taken away, it means to be like snatched away by force. Like orphaned. That's literally what the word means. They were snatched away by force. We were taken away for a short while in person, not in spirit. We're all the more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once. And listen, yet Satan hindered us. And that word hindered there, it means that Satan was putting roadblocks, things in the road to hamper them from getting back. He describes the opposition. He's not sugarcoating it. He's not downplaying it in any way. And just as we talked about, most of us won't face the kind of persecution Paul did. We won't face the kind of suffering they did. But it can be just as fierce. And when it does come, our temptation, their temptation, it's the same temptation. Maybe it's easier just to go along to get along. Maybe it's easier not to say anything. Maybe it's, it's easier to shrink off and be quiet, to keep our, our faith to ourselves so that nobody will turn on us. That's the easier thing to do. But let me just remind you of this. Your relationship with Jesus is personal, absolutely. Absolutely. Every one of us for ourselves must make a decision to repent of sins and trust in Jesus Christ. Your relationship with him is personal, but it was never intended to be private. And sometimes I'll talk to folks about, about their, their relationship with Christ, and they'll say, well, you, well, you know, that's a, that's a private matter. No, it's a personal matter, but it was never intended to be private. We had the marriage conference here last night, the marriage night via Right Now Media, and we had nine couples that were here and then two that, will, that joined us virtually. And we were talking about this wonderful, blessed relationship God has given us called marriage. And you know, your marriage is a very personal thing. But there's a reason why most married people wear a ring. It is a personal thing, but it's not a private thing. I'm not trying to hide it from the world that I'm married. It's, that's why I wear this, so it sticks out. That's why you wear one, so it stands out. 
And our relationship with Christ is similar. It is a personal thing, but it's never intended to be a a private thing. And he says back there in verse 15, he said to keep God's message of how we can be reconciled to him from people. To keep that from people. To say, listen, my relationship with Jesus is private. I'm not going to live it. I'm not going to talk about it. And he said to keep that message of how we can be reconciled from people, either by opposition or by omission on our part. Listen, you listen to what he said. It displeases God there in verse 15. It's hostile to all men. I think we talked last week or maybe the week before how we cannot in one breath say that we, we, we try to love all people, but, it, but in the next breath say, but I'm not going to tell them about what can meet their greatest need. Those two things cannot go together. We absolutely can't say that we love all of mankind, but I'm not going to tell them about how they can spend eternity in heaven with God. Because that's hostile to keep the message of Christ from people, either by opposition or by omission. The opposition was severe. But in the midst of of what what was happening, Paul mentions the opposition that, that they faced. There in Philippi, they faced a great deal of opposition. They left Philippi, they come to Thessalonica, and and those same people that were opposing them in Philippi show up there in Thessalonica, more trouble meets them there. Paul and and his crew have gone on, the church is still experiencing it. He talks about the opposition, it's severe. But look there at verse 19. He says, but who is our hope, our joy, our crown, our exaltation? Is it not even you? See, he, he notices He points out that the the opposition is severe. But God is securing victories every day around us, in our lives and through us and around us. And Paul sees them. It would have been easier for him to only see the opposition, only see the roadblocks that Satan was throwing in his path, only see the things where he had been frustrated and trying to do what what he knew God called him to do. But yet he saw the victories. He said, who is our hope? Where is our joy coming from? Where is our crown? And that really is another athletic illustration, the crown they would give to the victor in an athletic event. Who is our crown of exaltation? It's the work that God has done in you. Listen, you and I are are going to face opposition. We're going to face difficulty. And we have to just remind ourselves to notice the victories that God is winning in our personal life. Maybe you're a little bit further along in your faith today than you were yesterday. Acknowledge the victory. Celebrate the victory. Maybe you're able to have a conversation with someone about Christ that you were not able to have three or four months ago. Acknowledge the victory. Celebrate the victory. Notice them. Call attention to them. He saw the victories every day. Some of those victories are big, some are small. Those are encouragement for us when the battle gets hot, when the battle gets difficult. And the other resource that God gives us is the ultimate victory, that last part of verse 19. He said, Is not our hope, our joy, our crown, you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? And he encourages us listen, don't just look around for the victories today, that's an encouragement. That's a wonderful thing that that keeps us going and just reminds us of God at work, the victories that He's winning. But He reminds us to keep a long view here. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, it's just a couple chapters over. And He's talking here about the rapture, I believe. That time in the end times when Jesus is going to come and gather His church up and will kick off that end time, that seven years of tribulation at the end times. And this is how He describes it. He said, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. The voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And Paul draws their attention to this this end times event, that in the end, when Jesus comes for you, at his coming, he said, in the midst of opposition, in the midst of difficulty, pick your eyes up. Take a long view of what is happening. Listen to the, the shouts of victory. The Lord himself descends from heaven, a shout, the voice of the archangel, a trumpet of God. Listen, this is a victorious event. And he reminds them in the midst of opposition, remind yourself of that, that this victory has already been won. 
keep a long view of the fight. Because though Satan's going to try, he will not succeed. God's work will happen. It will be accomplished. God ultimately wins. When you became a Christian, I'll wrap up with this. When you became a Christian, you were a loss to Satan's team. When we came into this world, we come in as sinners, we are on Satan's team. We don't, we don't not acknowledgeably join it, but we're on it. That's where we start. And when you became a believer, you changed teams. And now he can't stop that. He can't change that. Our salvation is secure in the hands of Christ, and he can't pull us back. Satan can't pull us back onto his team. But we can't imagine he's happy about that. When you became a believer, you were a loss, and he's not happy about that. But here's what he can do. He can't stop us from going to heaven as believers, but what he can do is this. He can silence us. He can do his best to silence us so that we won't take anybody else with us. And that's exactly what he's trying to do in this world. But be encouraged. God's work won't stop. He's given us resources to live this countercultural mission. He's given us his, his word a powerful tool in our arsenal. He's given us His activity, a reminder of what He's doing, how He defends His people and His work. And He's given us a reminder of His victory, not just the small ones every day, but ultimately, I'm not, He's not just winning the battles, He ultimately has won the war. Now listen, as we wrap up our time, I just want to end our time with an invitation. And if you're here this morning and we're talking about what it means to trust in Christ, I shared the gospel message, the simple message of what it is. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you say, you know, you talk about that time in my life when I repented of sins and I trusted in Jesus and that has never happened. I don't know. If I died right now, I have no idea whether I'd spend eternity in heaven or not. Listen, if that's you and you're sitting there this morning, the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart and telling you, settle that matter today. Here's my invitation to you. After the service, I will be right there down front. Now, I'll wear my mask so we're all COVID clean, but I, I want you to come talk to me. If that is you, I don't want you to leave today with that matter unsettled. I want you to come talk to me. Just simply tell me this. I need to know Jesus. Settle that matter. If the Spirit of God is speaking to you today, or if there's some other matter, and maybe saying, listen, I, I've forgotten the resources that God's given me. I really have become a sort of go-with-the-flow kind of Christian. You just need someone to pray with you. Someone to encourage. I'm available to do that as well. Any other, any other challenges, any other issues that you're facing, I'm, I'm available to pray with you and encourage you in those matters as well. I'm glad you joined us today. I'm glad we had an opportunity for us to gather together, open up the Word of God again, be encouraged about how to be countercultural Christians. You know, our time here on Sunday morning is kind of like a huddle on the football field. You know, the team gets together and they huddle and they talk about what's the next play and they encourage one another, but there comes a time when we've got to get out of the huddle. They don't stay there. They get out of the huddle, they hit the line of scrimmage, and they, and they mix it up with the enemy. And as soon as we leave out these doors, we're breaking the huddle and hitting the line of scrimmage and mixing it up with the enemy. And my prayer is that as you go through those times of mixing it up this week, you're reminded of the resources God has given you to live this countercultural life, to take his message of hope to this lost and dying world. Well, let's stand together as I pray us out of here this morning. Let me invite you to slide your masks up as we stand together and pray with me this morning. Father, thank you once again for your message of hope, for the calling in our lives to be torchbearers of that message, for the resources that you've given us to carry it out, to be the countercultural Christians you want us to be, you need us to be in this world. And Father, we pray as we prepare to go out from this place and we're going to experience some opposition, even this week we'll experience it, in big ways or in small ways. But Father, when it's there, I pray you'd help us to just be reminded. That's why we hide your word in our heart, that we might not sin against you. We have it in those moments. Help us to be reminded of the resources you've already given us to fight this battle and to win this battle. Father, go with us now as we go from this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.